I'm Tristan from Wheelworks, and this is an interview I did with Rod Barnsley. Well, I don't know if he's interviewing me or I'm interviewing him, but it's completely unscripted, and we talk about everything from what's needed for e-bike wheels to aluminum versus brass nipples. This is probably best treated like a podcast and listened to rather than watched, but if you want to jump ahead to certain topics, we've marked them all as YouTube chapters. Rod has been mountain biking since the mid-1980s and has a huge depth of knowledge. He's fascinated by bikes and loves to experiment, to question and to analyze every part of his bikes. He's incredibly knowledgeable and really passionate. We met about 10 years ago and he's been riding our wheels and has been one of our ambassadors ever since. All right, let's jump in. All right, so I just wanted to share with everyone my, my experience with Wheelworks and fight wheels. Um, I don't know why everyone's not riding them because <laughs> I've had such a good run. And uh, so we just want to go through a bit of history and where we started, I think, I don't know how soon into the program I, I started, but I've, I've been trashing wheels my whole life, back when they were never built properly, and I ended up with a, a Wheelworks built derby wheel, the American, made in America, weren't they? Can't no, they weren't made in America, he never made them in America, they were made in China from, from day one, but he was based um, just north of San Francisco in Sausalito, yeah. Race scrubs. He was like the originator of wide rims. I remember um, we had a customer bring one in, one of us to build them up. At the time, we were building like a lot of stands rims and stuff like that. And like 21, 22 millimeters internal was like a wide rim. You know, like Mavic had like a 17 and they'd gone to a 19 mil. Stands had gone out to like 21 or 22 or something. And then this Derby came in. It was like 34 millimeters. It was like, you know, 50 millimeters deep or something. We, I remember Gavin and I were just like, what the hell is this thing? Like it, was, it was like, it was unheard of, it was absolutely unheard of. And um, yeah, we built it up for this customer and, and managed to have a ride on it. And we were both like, this is just, like, this is just next level, it's unbelievably good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I don't remember why or how it happened, but I remember my first ride on them and it just blew my mind. I couldn't believe it, the, the comfort and the, the stability of that, yeah, that wide room. But everyone scoffed at it, didn't they? So <laughs> yeah. tell me about about the issues that you had there. I mean, I was a believer from day one because of just the ride quality. And, you know, I like to think I ride pretty hard and I, I wasn't wasn't soft or vague or squirmy. So um, why did you stick with 35? Don't forget to mention that a lot of my feedback had to do <laughs> Honestly, I was going to say that. Like, uh, the, um, the first customer that brought it in was like an absolute train spotter, like you know, like read a lot of internet stuff and came in with this wide rim. And, you know, we were kind of skeptical in, internally as well. And then, you know, you, you after riding it, we were like the same takeaways that you have, like you just get more grip, you get more traction, the tires and feel like it's trying to pull itself off the rim all the time. So after riding it, it was obvious. But at the time, I mean, you know, the cycling, the cycling industry, it definitely has its trends and it definitely comes in, you know, in cycles and things. And at the time, like, wide rims were just not cool there was nothing cool about it it was that stage where weight dominated everything you know you, you, it's kind of early 29er days remember when 29ers had the mega steep head tube angle to make them feel like 26 inch bikes like it was it was that era i couldn't turn my front wheel would hit my toe <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but you know they wanted to make these 29ers to feel like this like uber responsive 26 inch thing that's trying to pitch you off all the time right and at that time, the concept of having like a heavier wheel that had more grip and traction just wasn't what people wanted to hear. And honestly, it was like you were you were instrumental in like in us continuing and pushing <laughs> with that. Yeah. yeah. And um, you know, we were for years we had to beat the wide rim drum, and it just fell on deaf ears. And then you know, after probably five or six years of that, the industry did start flipping a little bit, and all of a sudden. Customers did come to us wanting wide rims. They've read about it. They've heard about it. You know, their mm. friends have had them, and and now, you know, this, you know, now thirty millimeters is a, a normal or a narrow rim. Mm. So I'd just like to talk to, about that as well. At, back at the beginning, the industry had decided that twenty six was as wide as they needed to go, and now they've gone to thirty, and they seem to have stalled there. And if we were going to have a guess about it, would say it's, it's not getting any further. But that's what we said about twenty six. So. Where do you think we are now? I mean, we tried 40, didn't we? And I loved it because I love everything. But um, it had its benefits because you could run super low pressures, which is, which is comfort plus and grip plus. You know, lower pressure, more grip. It's as simple as that. So the problems we had then with the tyres didn't match the 35mm rim. 
now they do, and now other companies are doing the wide rims, where are we at? Is it, you must have put some thought into this. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think e-bikes are going to be the big changer. Like a few years back, we went into that plus size tire, right? And the 2.8, 3.0. Which I thought was going to take over the world. And, and it didn't, right? Yeah. And yeah. part of that, I think, was the rims were too narrow at the time. So you get that tractor beam, you know, yeah. the halfway through a corner, the tire starts squirming and pulling you out of the corner. Yeah, Specialized did that. They're running a um, 29 mil rim with a, a 3.0 tire. It was ridiculous. It's not going to work, no. yeah. Um, I think what we're going to see now is once kind of everyone's got an e-bike and all of a sudden that extra 5, 10, 20 watts of drag on the tire doesn't matter anymore, mm, mm. I think we will go wider again. Mm. I mean, at the moment, like, we've settled on kind of 30 as a downcountry XC kind of bordering into trail. And then as soon as you're putting on, like, a set of minions in that kind of 2.4, 2.5 size, um, the 35 mil rim seems to support that really well. I think tire widths, even on those big e-bikes, like they're coming back, aren't they? They, they sort of seem to be stabilizing around that 2.5, 2.6. Yeah. We haven't gone out to the 2.8, 3.0 again. Yeah. I think we possibly will. And then yeah. when we do, I think the rims will get wider as well. Yeah, I think I think if we go to that, the problem with that 2.8 was it was bordering on um, vagueness. But if, if the carcass is heavy and the e-bike, it doesn't matter with the e-bike, yeah, sure. I mean. I look at bike trends and they've pretty much followed motorcycles but years behind so if you look at a motorcycle super wide rims oh and they're mullet and what's happening now yeah. so i think we could end up different width rims fatter on the back or who knows yeah i mean i think yeah. e-bikes are really interesting because i think the whole bike is going to change like the concept of having a, a motor that drives a chain, that drives a derailleur, that shifts across a cassette, and it's just ridiculous. Like, it, it's absolutely ridiculous, you know? To be able to put the motor into a gearbox unit, it's all sealed up in one piece. Mm. You know, you do your yearly oil change, and, and that's it. You know, a gearbox motor is one unit. Like, to me, that's obvious that that's where we're gonna go, but, you know, we haven't got there yet. And I think that there's gonna be all sorts of things like that, like wheel size, like rim width, the e-bikes at the moment are a normal bike with a motor added onto them and in another five or ten years there'll be fresh eyes looking at this from a you know a, yeah. a holistic bike point of view rather than adding bits onto an existing yeah. and part of that's customer driven right like one of the challenges of running a business as well is that it's it's easy to come up with these things that are that you think are going to be obvious to everyone but then no one wants to buy them yeah. so you, you kind of have to move at the pace of the industry um, in, in production, right? In production, it's three yeah. years, three years behind. Yeah. Or three years in front. Yeah, and if you're talking small business as well, like if we're getting molds made and things like that, I mean that stuff costs a lot of money. Like it's which is difficult. Which is why the rims have only gradually got wider, right? Because they're too scared to think three years ahead and go, you know, we, we better only increase them a few mil, and not go any wider. Yeah, definitely. But anyway, I'm bored with that. Let's talk about. <laughs> I mean, obviously you make your own wheels here, and they're pretty good you and I reckon, but everyone out there knows that you're just getting them off the shelf in a, in a factory in <laughs> yeah. Taiwan, all right? So um, no one will listen to me, better listen to us now. What's the deal? Tell us about the rims, about the difference between what's available and what you've done. Well, let's start with that. Okay, it's a big question and it will vary, uh, it will vary a little bit across road, mountain, gravel and in road in terms of rim brake and disc brake which are totally different as well. If we're looking at mountain bike stuff... That's all I care about. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean moulds are... Um, moulds are the expensive thing with, with rims and the mould is, uh, is either an aluminium or a steel, um, you know, massive, literally weighs a ton, hunk of metal that's got the kind of rough shape of the rim machined out of it. And it's usually a clamshell, kind of two pieces, and it's got inserts that go in around the outside just to keep everything together. The, the quality of the mold is what determines the quality of the rim. The molds wear, they cost a hell of a lot of money to make. So if you're making like a bazillion of them, you'll invest in a steel mold. We don't make a bazillion of them, so we invest in like soft tooling, so aluminum molds that will wear out faster, but for the kind of mid-level quantities we do, it's absolutely fine. So hang on a minute, so you've got your own mold. So, so these molds are made up of um, a ten, usually about 10 pieces. Some of that stuff, like the internal section where the tire sits and the internal width, we don't have a unique proprietary um, 
mold for that. So yeah. we we have a, um, a partner in mainland China that makes the best quality rims in the entire world, and they have developed a bead seat and that inside of the, the rim that works perfectly. Why would we remake that? Yeah. So, so what if what has Wheelworks done to the the rims that a customer will buy, a flight wheel or enduro light or whatever? What is unique about that compared to AliExpress, so. Yeah, so um, so the overall shape of the rim, the terms of the, the width and the way that the uh, you know the rim visually looks from the outside. But who designed that? You? Uh, we, we in, in combination with this this Chinese company. Um, I'm not going to claim that I can design the most amazing rim in the world. These guys that make rims for you know hundreds of other companies, they've got so much knowledge around what works and what doesn't work. And like we can shoot off on a parallel discussion here around like you know the the, the Chinese and their way of thinking and, and iterating on design versus like the kind of European or American way where you know they do all the heavy engineering, settle on a design, produce something, and then don't change that design for five years or so. Whereas the you know the Chinese way of doing it is iterate, something breaks, fix it, iterate again, something breaks, something else breaks, fix it, iterate again. So they're just constantly doing this iteration. Mm. And this company that we work with, I mean, they've kind of gone through that for 20 odd years of this iterating approach between, you know, our rims, but also, you know, other people's as well for other companies. So they, they know what works, you know, they've made something for another company and they've seen that it works or that it doesn't work. And they're able to come to us and, you know, when we say, this is what we want to do, these are the outcomes that we want. Um, they're able to say, well, you yeah, know, we can do that. We can't do that. We suggest you do this. So, so, you know, it's, it's not us designing a rim, like it really yeah. is a combo of yeah. like their experience and our experience from what we want in terms of a wheel building point of view. So is a rim that we get on a Wheelworks wheel, is it unique to Wheelworks? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Yeah. So surely they are using that, they've, they've helped you make this rim. Are they not taking that to themselves and selling it? elsewhere on an, as another brand yeah of course they are but that's that's why our rooms are so good as well right yeah. because we're leveraging that off what other people have done um you know the, the work that they've done with other companies mm. and you know they're they're doing the same with us and and using mm. that for um you know for other wheel branding companies mm. around the world whether that's you know our competitors or or not mm. and that's um and that's fine that's just like how that sort of development that's life. works yeah, yeah. basically and, and uh, honestly, I mean, the end result there is that we're getting rim quality, which is just unbelievably good, like incredibly good. Like yeah. we've bought, we've bought a lot of rims. We've had one arrive over the eight years we've been dealing with this factory. We've had one rim that we're unable to build up because of QC quality control issues. To put that in context, we were buying some extremely expensive American made rims. 30% of them we had to send back because tires wouldn't fit on them, because the little thing that was glued onto the top was too big, they wouldn't build up true, the nipples yeah. would pull out before they got up to tension. 30% versus one in thousands and thousands and thousands. Yeah. Like The quality is unbelievably good. Yeah. Well, let's get a bit more on the quality. I mean, I've, I don't know how long, how long I've been riding your wheels. I've had multiple sets. It's got I've had decades, some for ages. Right? Really? I don't know. But I've, I broke a derby rim, um, and that was just riding along the grass and I hit, hit a, must have hit a rock. But I just super glued that up because we had to wait for a warranty from Derby and it took about a month and I rode a glued up rim. It was fantastic. And I haven't broken one of your rims until last week. I broke an Enduro Light. I hadn't told Tristan that it was on my e-bike and I probably shouldn't be running a lightweight rim on there, but um, that was a big huck onto a, onto a tree root. I went and had a look at it the other day. It's, it's like, what was I thinking? Um, but, um, you know, I haven't had to touch my wheels. They're the most boring wheels on the planet. I've never had to true them. They've never come loose. Um, once I put a stick through and broke some spokes and I rode a downhill track out, I had about a five millimeter wobble with three spokes missing. Um, you keep fixing them. For other people, I mean, you know, that's the only damage I've done. Um, I keep hearing rumors that you've, you've denied warranties. You know, is this just Chinese whispers? I, I hope so. Um... I can remember one, or I can remember two customers where very clearly, like they are using a wheel that just wasn't designed for the type of mm. riding that they're doing. 
and we suggested to them at the time that um, you know we'll, we'll continue to replace rims under warranty, but it's just going to continue to happen if you continue mm. to ride like that. So um, you know we suggested that we move to like a like a mega super duty mm. uh, aluminum rim. Um, that was a long, long time ago, and I'm, I'm mm. guessing if you have heard any rumours that that was probably what it they're, was. They're quite a while ago, and it's always third, fourth, fifth hand about you know. Something that's I, I haven't witnessed it from anyone in particular, and we some of my big heavy mates have been riding on wheels and seem pretty happy. Yeah, but we get breakages, you know. Yeah. We're not we're not shy about well, that. Like, well, the thing is, I probably shouldn't admit this, but I came in a few months ago, didn't I? Because uh, and took away all your broken rims for the last two years, carried them in one arm. I won't tell you what I did with them. <laughs> Might have glued them up. Super glue. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, that's pretty impressive. I've heard other companies, 70% um, of their room manufacturer for warranty. Now it's great having a warranty, right? And you were one of the first people to do that. We were, I think that we were the first person in the world to have a lifetime warranty on mm. a carbon room. I'm pretty comfortable to, to say yeah. that, yeah. yeah. I, um, yeah, so one company is, um, sorry, that's what I was gonna say, is that it's great having a warranty. Most carbon wheels do have one now, but if they break, it's no good when you're out on holiday or it's going to take you a month to get a new rim or you can't ride or you have to borrow a wheel. But that's what's great about your wheels. They don't seem to break very often. So that I can go away not being worried that I'm going to break it, which is the main thing. Yeah, absolutely. And we've never been sense? shy about the fact that they do break from time to time. Like mm. that's inevitable. It is part of it. Some of it's... Um, it's really interesting, like some of it's like what you said, like I hucked to a root, like it was obvious that the wheel was going to break when I hit that. And you know, my guess is that no matter what aluminium rim you had on, it would have put a dent into the aluminium rim as well. Mm. And then the other side of it is sometimes you just get like, I was just riding along, I didn't really hit anything that hard mm. and a rim cracked. Mm. Um, you know, and it just, it just kind of... That perfect storm of a right shaped rock or whatever, which I think was what happened to me in the grass that time. Yeah. So let's, let's move away from the rims, um, the hubs. Once again, I've seen those hubs before in the market, but you've done something special to them. It's not like you've made one yourself. Tell us about your hub, the, the um, what's it called again? The dial. Dial, that's right. Dial hubs. Oh, hang on, before we do that, oh. uh, one thing about the rims. Oh, now yeah. I've forgotten because you... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are they around? I, I had something. I had something really interesting as well. It wasn't about the profile? You changed oh, the profile to no, make it No, I was talking about why we started doing our own rims. Oh which was, you know, you talk about, I mean, Derby, um, um, I, everyone's got a warranty these days, right? Mm. Absolutely everyone. It, it, it doesn't mean much though. And one of the key reasons that we started doing our own rims, both in terms of our road and our mountain bike, was that I was so tired of having to do this, that, and the other, take these photos, send this thing oh. away, wait for someone to do the paperwork, has to go to the American head office, they have to approve it. And literally like a month later, a replacement rim or a, an approval to build a wheel would come back to us, yeah. you know? And that is so fucking stupid that I thought, no, nah, we're taking all of this and we're doing it ourselves. Well, most companies have a full-time warranty guy, right? It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. But by us having our own brand, our own rim, mm. like we have control, we can say, you know, yes, that's a warranty and we'll fix it. Mm. And we can have warranty, you know, we can make sure we have enough rims in stock to cover any warranty that are going to come in. And that's where we get our 24 hour turnaround. You know, we're not waiting for some far flung head office to give us mm. approval. We can just get on and do it. And that honestly, that was an absolute key. Like we went through the ringer with a, a variety of road and mountain bike companies that were all promises to begin with. And then, you know, when production mm. issues happen and quality issues happen and warranty issues happen, we're the ones, you know, we built the wheels, we're the ones that end up sort of holding the baby in it. Yeah. It drove me to build our own rooms. Great. Yeah. And that's where the hubs came from. Yeah. To tie okay, tell us about the hubs. Yeah, so it was the same thing. So um, there are other brands of hubs that we, we still use and will continue to use. And I think it's super important for us as a brand that we do have a range of hub options. And one thing that's really interesting with hubs is a lot of people come in and they're like, I love Hope Hubs. I've never had a single problem with a Hope Hub. The bearings last forever. I love the fact that they're made in the UK and they come in the colors. All I want is a, nut, is a pair of Hope Hubs. And then the next customer comes in and they're like, I hate Hope Hubs. I hate the sound. The bearings wear out quickly. 
this breaks, that breaks. It's so fascinating how people get these like polarizing mm. um, experiences with the mm. same product. So for us to have a range of hubs, I think is mega, mega important. Mm. And as part of that, our dial hubs. And in the exact same way that we do with, um, with the rims, we, we license the freehub body mechanism from a Taiwanese company. They make hubs for a variety of companies, probably about the size of us and up. There's no one probably smaller than us that's, that's using them, um, right up to you know, some big companies. Mm. So what's unique about them? Because I know there's a couple of things which, which blow my mind. Yeah, so we've got, um, so in terms of the free hub body mechanism, we essentially license that. So they've designed and developed that. It might sound like it's really easy to make a hub, but it's actually not. And I think if you look at some of the, certainly some of the boutique hubs where they creak um, under pedaling load, where the axles break, you know, where they, they do all sorts of weird things, that shows how hard it is to actually make a, you know, good mm. functional hub. So we, um, we were introduced to this Taiwanese company. We um, were really impressed with what they can do from a production point of view and the quality and all the testing that they do. So we licensed that free body. We're able to tweak it a little bit and do a few little things that we want to do with it. But they, you know, they've designed and developed that. We then buy it. We then pair it up to the rest of the hub, which we've designed ourselves. So all the key wheel building stuff, which for us is the important one. So that's things like making sure that the the hub flanges are angled so that the spokes actually point at the rim rather than pointing vertical like goalposts. Making sure that um, the little the hole in the hub where the spoke goes through, the actual size of that hole. This is super, important. This bit. <laughs> that's really important because if you're building a trillion wheels on a production line, you want to make that hole as big as possible so that the person can just throw the spokes into those holes and they go together really easily. But then you've got that massive big hole in your flange and the spoke kind of rattling around inside of it. And that's yeah, when like, it starts. Like that. Like, it's only being held by a little bit of the hole. Yeah. Whereas if you've got a smaller hole, it's gripping more yeah. of the spoke head. Right? And the other element of that is the chamfer that's on both sides. And yeah. that has to match up. And you'll notice that some um, like DT spokes have a real tight J-bend on them. Whereas mm -hmm. the ones that are used in um, like a wheel building facility have a real long J mm -hmm. on them. And that's again to make it even easier to build. Mm. But you combine, you know, like a production spoke with a, a production based hub, and that's why spokes break at mm. J bend. Yeah. When we design a hub that's got all these tight holes, mm. perfect chamfers, and use a spoke that's designed around that, you know, we, we literally get, I'm not exaggerating, we get zero broken spokes out oh, of yeah. there. You get the occasional one from a stick going through, but we don't mm. get any broken just through you know, normal mm. use or whatever. So just to clarify for the, for the punters out there, for a robot or a, or, or a company to mass produce wheels, they have to make, do some things to make it easy to lace the wheel and build it, which actually create a weaker wheel. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And that's where straight pull spokes come in as well. Like straight pull spokes have one advantage, which is they are significantly faster to, to lace the wheel. Mm. And um, if you're building, you know, like all day, every day, the exact same model of wheel, if you can save 10 minutes on lacing, that's an absolute massive amount of time. Mm. That's where straight pull hubs come in. Mm. And what's the big problem with straight pull? It's that angulation, isn't it? It's the angulation, which you'll never get quite right. Yeah, the he way heads you can. Too have to be too close together. Yeah. So you're losing that. Yeah, Support. yeah, and especially on the drive side, right? Yeah. Where you've already got the cassette pushing in to the center line of the hub. And a pain to build, right? Because they spin. Uh, it, it, yeah, if you're hand building them. Yeah. If you've got a machine just yeah. <laughs> driving them in, that's not an issue. <laughs> so are all wheels built by a machine? Um, Obviously, no. Gav, Gavin hands... Gavin, wake up! Get back to work! <laughs> Gavin hand builds everything. There's no machines used apart from your stress um, Grimlock. Thing, right? Yeah. Mm. In every every wheel building facility I've ever seen, either in person or um, you know factory tours and stuff like that, there will always be a human involved in it. And some of the big brands that claim everything is hand built, uh, what they mean is that final truing stage is done by hand by a human. Mm. But almost certainly they've used some automation to get them mm. to that point. Which means they've got big holes in the hubs, so the robot can feed them through big curves in the J bend. Yeah. So the strength isn't there at the, at the spoke head. Yeah, and even um, you know the machines that tension and true the wheels, you 
there are some companies that, that use those machines and do a really good job, like the Santa Cruz Reserve wheels, for example. Like they're machine built wheels that are then hand trued, mm -hmm. but they've um, like rather intentionally slowed down the process so that they, the machine is doing more than if they just said, oh, like I'll just do two passes. It's true enough, it's fine. You know, for them, for as an example, like I know that they're putting more into it, into the machine element of it, than, than other companies would with the machine, where it's just a, a volume game as well. Oh, and the machine built wheels have used shorter spokes because it's easier to get them threaded, right? But quite often the thread doesn't go right up into the head, so that's why we get broken nipples. Yeah, yeah and you'll get a um, definitely a different nipple because I want to drive it in from the backside. Mm. Um, mm. And normally that combined with what you're saying, that's why it pops the top of the nipple off. Mm. Yeah. yeah. None of that here. Okay, well that's good. Oh, well, so the thing with the, what I like about the dial hubs is they've got a chromo axle. I've never broken one. And everything slides off, there's no steps. You can just slide the axle out, then you can tap the bearings out or pull them out or however you do it. Free hub, nothing, no tools. Toolless dismantle, put back together. And mine, mine I don't clean them ever. And when I have a look at them, there's a little bit of black grease, but no crap's got in there. They're, I'm pretty happy with them. I'm really happy with them. We've done them for about five years now. And um, initially they didn't have that chromo axle. Initially they had an aluminum axle. And that was when a large cassette, <clears throat> when a large cassette had like 40 teeth on it. And um, full suspension bikes had a lot less travel and there's definitely no e-bikes. And the aluminum axles worked just fine for that. But then when Eagle cassettes came in, when long travel suspension with all the misalignment that goes on with the rear suspension, yeah. Um, and of course e-bikes, the aluminum axles weren't up to that and we started breaking them. And then we did a, um, we, we proactively contacted every customer that had bought one and said, if you want a steel axle, you know, we will send you one and uh, it was all free of charge. Mm. I remember when that happened. I was yeah. like, hell yeah. And then it's not like it's heavy, right? It's a beautiful yeah. piece of thin polished pot. Yeah, centerless yeah. ground, 4140 chromoly steel. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so that's hubs then. What about what about Gav? Oh, Gav's woken up. What does it? What does he do that's so special? Gav's got an amazing ability to really focus and um, just put an amazing amount of attention to detail into every wheel. Mm. And <laughs> and it, it kind of sounds like one of those easy things to do, and then in, in practice, in reality, it's it's not. And mm. Gav is absolutely amazing at building. You know, like I've always kind of said, like building a wheel is not difficult. It's not hard at all. Anyone can build a wheel. I right? built, like, I built my build last. Wheels. You know, they're still going. <laughs> building yeah. a good wheel is difficult. Building really good wheels is it's reasonably difficult, but it's not impossible. What the hard part about running a wheel building company is building really good wheels every single wheel, time after time after time. And we put them in boxes and send them off around the country and around the world. Like you cannot have them arrive in Sydney and something be wrong with it and mm. it goes out of true and it needs to come back or you just cannot have it happen and we like when i started the company we started on the internet before there was an internet like from day one i was shipping wheels all over the country mm. and mm. australia so from day one i had to figure out well how do i make wheels that don't have to come back for that like bed in retrue thing mm. that hand-built wheels need and that was an absolute key to you know, figuring out what that process is, figuring out how we can do that consistently. Mm. And Gav is the absolute master at taking those processes and taking those steps and doing them you know, to the mm. absolute top quality every single time. I can't believe how fussy is like, you know, like 0 0.001 of a something out and he's playing around with it. I mean, look at him now, it's amazing. Um, so that, interesting talking about that, I've had plenty of carbon wheels. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a mechanic as well, amazing mechanic. And um, so good, I can do at least two days a week. But I've put a, a tire on a on a wheel after it's been built, or just checking it, and the tension drops dramatically. And people go out and ride it, and then the spokes come loose. Why don't you all do that? Because um, we developed a tool called Grimlock, which is a pneumatic press, and essentially Grimlock uh, overloads the wheel well beyond um, you know what what even you as a rider can do. Um, so that we can basically we can do all of that stuff in house before the wheels even finish being built, and that way when it does go out the door, when it does get put on a bike, when a wheel and a tire is put on it, none of that stuff happens. You'll still get a small tension drop from the tire mm. being fitted, um, but normally you'll see that the wheel goes out true as well when that happens. 
Ours definitely don't because of how even the ten spoke tension mm -hmm. is. And we actually build um, the rear wheels off to the drive side ever so slightly so that when the tire is fitted and everything shrinks and the tension drops off a little bit, that the wheel actually centers itself up. No. Yeah, yeah. So we actually build the, the, the front end, or well, the, the front's off to the disc side, mm. the rear is off to the drive side. And uh, I'm not gonna tell you how much, and it varies front to rear, but they're built intentionally. If you get a, a brand new wheel and check the dish, it's actually not centered. But when you put a tire on, it will be centered. Why didn't you tell me that when I built mine? They're probably off now. How much your hour? <laughs> okay, um, that's great. Uh, so we had the, we've had the flight wheels and 30 mil for ages, and then for some stupid reason, you decided you got so cocky that you could build a trail light, 30 mil rim, and an enduro light with less spokes, less glue, less carbon, and still rate them to heavy riders. Is there a limit on the on the on the new light rims? There's not a rider weight limit in the sense of like a durability point of view. Mm. What, um, so, so the Enduro Light's probably the one to talk about there. Mm. So it's got a, a 24 hole front rim, so fewer spokes, uh, lighter carbon, uh, less carbon and less resin. It does not have the same lateral stiffness as a 32 hole version three flight. I don't notice that one bit because I'm puny a big, strong, muscly guy will notice that, that the front wheel will track more like an aluminum. Oh, you'll notice it, yeah. <laughs> it won't get stuffed into a corner quite as well. Um, when it's really loaded up in a rock garden or something, it, it won't hold its line as well. So from a durability point of view, no issues. From a, is that the right wheel for a, like a big, strong, heavy dude on a big e-bike or something like that? No, it's not the right one. So, Will you sell an enduro light to a big heavy guy or someone with an e-bike? I mean, I know I've got them, but you, you said to me, I said I wanted to do it because that's what I had at the time. And you said, oh, well, that's what you're here for to test them, right? And, and I broke one, right? It was rider error. I'm happy to admit that. Um, what, what is your, what, what's your plan for the enduro lights when you get an e-bike customer and they, and they want their lo the lightest wheels possible? Well, again, like there's no problems using the Enduro lights on an e-bike. I think it, the conversation that we have with the customer at that point, though, is, is this the right wheel set for you? And that's something that comes across in every conversation, right? Like, it's super easy for us to build these mega light pairs of wheels. And, you know, it might sound amazing, but when you've got that 25 millimeter wide rim and a, like a noodly wheel that doesn't yeah. track well, well, the extra 100 grams or 200 yeah. grams that you save doesn't matter. Well, you've got a motor, right? So, I mean, you know, mine's on my Kinevo SL, which I'm trying to keep as light as possible, but it's still nearly 19 kilos, but I've got enduro lights on it. So psychologically, I feel like I'm keeping it light, which is great. But um, should I be running them on my Kinevo SL? I mean, it's a pretty capable bike. I'm going, doing some big stuff on it. Big, fast, heavy, chunky. Does that make you nervous? No, not really. Have you, um, if you've swapped between the front wheels, especially, do you notice how much pop you get on the enduro light? Oh, look. I, I ran them on my acoustic, on my Evil Reckoning. It just phenomenal. The bike dances down the trail. It's, you know, that rotational mass that people have been talking about for years, it's a thing, right? It's pretty obvious. And I like to run light tires as well. I try and keep them under, under 1,100 grams now. It used to be 800, but, you know, just we're going harder and faster. We need stronger tires. And, you know, hopefully the rims are keeping up, which you all seem to be. Yeah, I think in a lot of respects, the, the, the tires getting heavier and, and people's uh, willingness to run heavier tires, I think it is helping you know, rim durability and wheel durability, both right. from ours and, and other brands. Um, I remember talking to someone, this will probably won't make the cut, talking to someone in the warranty department where they used to have heaps and heaps of wheel problems and then they started specking the uh, grid tire, so the grid, yeah. so the, the, the DH casing tire, yeah. and all of a sudden all their wheel problems yeah. stopped, you know? So, if customers are willing to put on a um, you know twelve hundred gram tire, mm. of course it's gonna. Help. Oh, yeah. it's a buffer, right? It is a buffer. Yeah, yeah. acts as a bit of suspension. It's, it's the only problem that allows them to ride harder and faster. So that wheel needs to be strong still. Yeah, yeah. And e-bikes. I mean, e-bikes change everything. Like in terms of the rear hub, the amount of power that needs to go mm. through it, in terms of how the spokes react, and then to a certain degree as well, the rims. Like, you know, for a lot of like big, heavy, strong dudes, like they don't have a lot of pop on the bike mm. to begin with, and all of a sudden they've got this mega capable bike that will just let them just plow into whatever they want. 
and it, it puts a lot of load through everything when we see it with suspension you know we see it on wheel side of things and then i know you know you talk to bike shops and stuff like how quickly you've gone through brake pads and even mm. things like um you know saddles getting worn out right because mm. you're just just smashing your mm. gooch into it more frequently <laughs> so uh, an important thing which i don't know if you can answer this but okay an e-bike's 10 kilos more than a than a non-e-bike what's the difference between a 80 kilo rider on an e-bike or a 90 kilo rider on an acoustic bike is there a different load on the on the wheels yeah there definitely is because the the e-bike doesn't get off the ground the same way you know even a bike like the kinevo sl which is kind of light and, and poppy you know it's still it's still planted way way more than a um you know that a heavier rider on a lighter bike would be able to, to oh, so get it off the ground so a heavier rider on a non-e-bike is actually putting more more load on the bike because they can go go bigger is that what you're saying no i was saying the opposite oh. i think the, the heavier rider on the lighter bike tends to be lighter on wheels oh okay whereas it's the e-bike that just sticks to the ground and yeah. hits everything oh it doesn't bounce up over things and yeah. yeah it's just plowing trying to hit everything yeah 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 i'm glad we cleared that up yeah yeah hmm. i think so we um we've started asking well we which if, when we get a warranty, we, we try and ask as many questions as we can to understand, you know, what what the circumstances were. Sometimes it's pretty difficult. Like a lot of the, the cracks we get are pretty innocuous. And that's, I think that there's pre, pre-existing damage in the rim from that big hit that you did last week. And it is only shown when you hit that little, you know, little root or twig or whatever it might be in the trail. Um, but the e-bike question is definitely one that we ask. But it's hard to know um, as a percentage of customers who's got an e-bike and who hasn't. Um, we for all of our version 2 and version 3 rims like they're all e-bike ready so uh, our wheel set that we sold uh, when we started doing version 2s which was six years ago I think um, a six year old set of version 2s will go on to a modern e-bike and no but, it'll, but it'll have to have a boost kit because it will be non-boost <laughs> yeah yeah that's fine but we've got boost kits yeah. Yeah. Um, can we just talk a little bit about aluminium nipples yeah because everyone seems to use them and what does it save about 16 grams per wheel so i don't see the point why do people do it is it for the color aren't they don't they break more what's going on um i don't think they break more we sometimes see them corroding more in mm. terms of stands getting past the rim tape or sealant getting yeah. past the rim tape you've got a fix for that don't you we you talk about double taping the mm. rims. Yeah, we double tape. Um, double Why doesn't everyone do that? Because it costs more and it takes more time. And I don't think I gave you that idea. I'm sure you did. Yeah, we'll give you I'll credit. take that one. <laughs> um, I don't think aluminum nipples break more frequently if, oh. if the wheel is well built with the correct spoke length. That's the thing, right? They break. Like I've seen a lot of factory built wheels yeah. that the spoke doesn't go into the head and so the head snaps off especially with a bit of corrosion yeah your spoke length has to be absolutely spot on for, for aluminium mm. nipples i mean we we've got that part of it nailed but if it's a millimeter too short and it leaves the top of the nipple and exposed then it just pops the tops off them absolutely mm. and that's an expensive that. balls up yeah and, and brass nipple if you just rebuild the same spoke same rim with brass nipples it'll stop that because the mm. nipple is able to mm. cope with that stress so from that point of view a brass nipple is better but what you're saying there is I'm going to use a brass nipple to cover up my mistakes, which mm. isn't, that's not quite a fair yeah. comparison, you know? So does that mean you've been making some mistakes because you told me the other day you were going to brass nipples? Yeah, so we, um, we used to use the, the haze made, uh, made in the USA aluminum nipples. And we have had, you know, we, we built with them for years and years and years, tens of thousands of nipples. We had zero problems with them. They changed something in the, the aluminum that they're using and, um, mm definitely it, it, the quality went down we haven't found a good replacement aluminium nipple that's as good as that nipple so we definitely use a lot more brass now and that's more from a um just a you know quality or supply issue rather than from a like the quality of the aluminium nipple mm. point of view yeah. mm. Mm. did you know that was that news to you yeah mm. We still mix, we do a bit of mix and match. So the main problem we see with aluminium nipples is the sealant getting past the tape and corroding yeah. them. And it's almost always on a rear wheel. It's very, very frequently on a front wheel. So on wheels like the Enduro Lite, we use aluminium nipples on the front. We save 20 grams by doing that, which Woohoo! doesn't sound like much, but at the same time, if you could take 20 grams off every component on your bike, it would be heaps. Mm -hmm. And then on the back, we use brass nipples um, just because 
if the tape gets damaged and the sealant gets down, then it just won't corrode the nipples as much. So we'll take the weight penalty on the back where it's kind of needed and we'll save the weight on the front where we don't need to worry about it as much. Mm. Yeah. And I think like in the 16 years we've been building, wi uh, building wills, in the 16 years we've been building you've, you've had nipples. I've had nipples. <laughs> I, I think we've had like maybe one with aluminium front nipples start breaking. Like it just doesn't happen. It's, it's always at the rear. Yeah. The ceiling gets in and of course there's more load going through because of that. Well, I'm sure I've told you this before, but working, you know, I've worked in bike shops my whole life and work for myself, but I've dealt with a lot of broken alloy nipples. It drives me insane. And it's an expensive fix. And it's always because the spoke's too short and quite often from a bike that's not used a lot. That's probably because it's not getting cleaned and it's corroding in some sense. There's some sort of reaction with the alloy and the nipples that's not to do with sealant as well, because this is pre-sealant days that things were corroding. What's going on there? Well, I mean, we live next to the sea, so you're definitely mm. getting a lot of, um, yeah, you're getting, getting a lot of corrosion just from that. Um, the nipple, of course, like the outside of it is anodized, but then when it's been turned as it's been tightened, that anodizing is probably worn off where it's sat against the rim. So you've got this, you know, lovely fresh bare aluminum that just wants to lap up sea salt and mm. yeah, and oxidize. Yeah. And that's what turns into that powdery, dusty, white stuff kind of thing. Yeah. And that's oxidation. That's oxidation. That's aluminum oxide. Yeah. And that obviously weakens the nipple. Yeah. I mean, aluminum oxide is like, um, like they use it on sanding pads and stuff. It's incredibly brittle and, and small, you know, once mm. it's broken down. But, um, but your nipple corroding into aluminum mm. oxide just turns into a brittle mess. Yeah. Mm. Um, one thing I didn't mention before. But I've noticed with your wheels, because I've, I've seen a lot of wheels, and you've got the nipple coming out of the rim, and then the spokes coming on at an angle, which is creating a weak point, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But your wheels, aren't, they're all straight, pretty much. Yeah. Why? Why? Because uh, we're going back to that discussion about making rims. We use a five-axis drill to drill those spoke nipple holes in the rim um, with our hubs and the range of hubs that we use in mind so that the spoke nipple points at the hub where the spoke is attached. Mm. And that sounds like something that's super, super basic and it costs extra money on every single room that we do. And, um, you know, if you're a project, project put up product manager for um, a company and trying to save some money, it's stuff like that that is super easy to send, save five, mm. 10, 20 dollars a, a rim by not doing. So if that's pointing in the exact right direction, that means it has to be laced up to the design of that rim. So that, one of your rims it has to be a two cross or a three cross or whatever. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. But all your wheels are two cross? All of our carbon wheels are two cross, yeah. Mm. And part of it is around that, just uh, ensuring that entry angle into the rim is correct. Yeah. All of the aluminum stuff is three cross. Yeah, because once you go three cross, the angle is a lot tougher, right? Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Mm. And the three cross, um, you know, in the modern world, it, it doesn't serve much purpose. Everything could be two cross. It's theoretically a bit softer, right? Yeah, it is a little bit softer. Yeah. Mm. And um, that's something that I think if, if people are buying like a, a heavy duty aluminium wheel set, that's, that softness tends to be what they, mm. what they want, mm. whether they kind of realize that or not. Mm. Okay. So a lot of people seem to like, obviously there's a lot of talk about the pros only run alloy rims. They refuse to run carbon. Um, People think that alloy rides better. Every time, because I've done a lot of bike testing for Spoke Magazine, and every time I ride a bike and I test it, it feels like shit. And so I'd put my wheels on it, and it just changes the ride. So explain that to me, why carbon gives you a different ride, and is it better? Um, it, it's a, there's a personal preference thing here, and there definitely are some people that... Uh, <laughs> There definitely are some people that... Thank God no one's that, ringing me. Um, Let's turn that off. There definitely are some people that prefer the feel of an aluminium wheel. And oh, they, like, they like the bike to feel dead. They like the bike to feel dead. They like it to feel a little bit vague. And Muted. A big part of that is the wheel weight. Um, you know, even though there might not be a massive difference in rim weight, the carbon rim will be lighter. And then for all the stuff we build, we use a much, much lighter spoke. So the wheel itself has got a lot less momentum to it. And that's what makes it fun. That's the poppy bit. That's the fun. That's where it gets stuffed into a corner and it, and it you know, dives into the corner more. That's the good side of that. Mm. The, arguably, the downside is that it doesn't have the same amount of momentum. 
So the bike will get stuck offline a little bit more. It will get pushed around by a rock or a root a little bit more. And generally the people that like aluminium wheels, they like the bike not getting pushed around mm. or they don't like the trade off. You know, they're, they're willing to- They want a bulldozer. Yeah, they want more of a bulldozer, yeah. Which is, if I was gonna say one word for carbon wheels, and that is zing. It just gives the bike a, a little bit of zing, like it's responsive and snappy, and um, I always thought it was just the weight thing. But now, that, like you say, carbon rims are the same weight now for most companies. Your wheels, obviously, weight versus strength is pretty pretty impressive. Um, but that, that crispness, that zing that you get from, well, that, I'm, that I notice, I, I just can't go back to Alloy. Just feels like I've got mud in the tires. Yeah, I'm the same. I don't like it, you know. Personally, I, I definitely, especially like you know, I've been riding enduro a lot, and that that front wheel. That I, I mm. love wheeling and manualing, you mm. know, kind of my North Shore growing up in Vancouver stuff. I just that front wheel. It's 150, 180 grams lighter than the already light version three. Mm. It just just takes off. It's just so much fun. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Funny, uh, you'd think Tristan's a roadie because that's all you've been doing, but. I've been out riding with you and uh, and I've seen some photos and I've seen some pretty big Canadian um, huck cliff, huck, cliff hucks and I went riding with you on Macro once in the shittiest weather and you were manualing down one of those trails, I can't remember, and I'm like, what? I, th I thought he was a roadie and I can't manual him, <laughs> this sucks, I don't like this guy anymore, like he's giving me free wheels. Oh no, I pay for them. That was a demo day we did at Macro uh -huh. and... Um, yeah, we don't do demo days very often, and that mm. one we did, and then the weather turned absolutely shit. And we ended up, we went up Salvation and down Deliverance, which is the grade five mm. trail. Mm. And um, as it turned out, like, having that crappy conditions was the best way to demonstrate wheels, because mm. we could have low tire pressures. Mm. And people that would normally be skating themselves down Deliverance, all of a sudden you can put them at like 19, 20, 21 PSI, mm. and they're like, holy shit, I've got grip, this is unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm still... I've met so many people who still run 30 PSI, right? And the wider the rim, the lower pressure, we've, we've proven that works with all our testing that we've done. So, you know, I'm, I'm 80 kilos and I run um, with a, say an XO tire, for, for example, I run 21 in the back and 19 in the front and I've never peeled a tire. It's incredible. And you think that's 66% of the pressure, which means third more grip. Is that what, working backwards? <laughs> yeah. Basically. So I'm getting a third more rubber touching the ground from that, yeah. that third of pressure off. It's you also got amazing. to look at it in suspension as yeah. well, right? Like if, if your tire is about 50 millimeters tall, if you're able to get an extra 10 millimeters worth of, of you mm. know, usable travel, that's the, that's the first 10 millimeters on your fork. Mm. It's a huge amount. Well, if your tire compresses to the rim and it's got 30 PSI on it, it's going to spring back very quickly, which is undamped rebound, right? And undamped compression, whereas softer pressure, it's not going to do it, so the compression might be a bit no, more. I'm not sure about that, actually. Oh. We're all rebound harder. Just say yes, just nod. Yeah, yes, you're right. Rod's right. <laughs> Are you running cush cores or tire inserts? Have you tried them? Yeah, look, I don't like cush core just because of the faff, but they are unbelievable because of the volume they do just like putting tokens in your forks but i actually just prefer like the huck norris style just a flat sandwich just because of the weight weights everything to me um it's nice to just have that little bit of um support before the tire hits the rim but i'm not running them in any of my bikes apart from my full turbo levo um just because i'm running eight psi in, in that in, in the akataras and i and it, there's you know i'm still hitting rocks and there's big some big rocks in there so i just want to make sure there's some protection there um I'll run it, if I run an enduro casing tire, definitely not because that gives me that that, that support. But a lot, you know, there's a, the trend now is for lighter tires and running an inset, um, especially if you've got a you know 120 gram inset, which gives you the same weight. But then you can run much lower pressures, which gives you way more grip. But then we run the risk of ripping our tire because the carcass isn't strong enough. Yeah. Do you like the way that it ramps? The tire because you know you say about the like the insert um it does the same as fork tokens right so mm. you can run a lower pressure but it ramps up a lot more mm. like do you like that do you not like it do you notice it well yeah i mean it's definitely noticeable with cush core and with the victoria airliner but the airliner doesn't offer any support it's really just a volume displacer and it's a little bit too much um so i cut mine down i modify a lot of my stuff cush core is phenomenal for that because it is just like a token you know it's taking up i don't know a quarter of your tire yeah. Whereas a Huck Norris is, you know, probably an eighth, 
So there's, there's not enough there. But definitely being able to run a soft pressure and feel your rim bottom out, but not get that ding, and then for the next three or four seconds, is super paranoid that you're blowing your tire and you're gonna die. <laughs> so um, it's just a trade-off, like everything. I try and sit on the fence, and I you know, cut my nose off to swipe my face sometimes. Sometimes it's good to go all the way. I can see why Kushko is so, so important, but it's a lot of weight. And like you ride, like most of your riding is in the Akaterawas. At if, the moment, yeah. If you, With lots of uh, international travel. Yeah. If you lived somewhere like um, like Queenstown, for example, where it's it's mm. faster, would you would that change? I mean, I assume it would change the tires you'd be using. Would it change whether you're using inserts? Um, yes. It, it, like it's so specific. If I had it my way, I'd be changing tires. Well, I do every day, and for different conditions. I like everything to be perfect, but. Yeah, the faster you go and the sharper the rocks, the more you've got to worry about inserts because you want the grip. And like putting more air into your tire, it's still easy to displace it with a sharp, like if you imagine smacking into a, say, a, 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 an ax, something that sharp, which a lot of rocks are, it doesn't have to displace much air to hit your rim. So if there's sharp rocks and you're going fast, which Queenstown's got a lot of, um, yeah, I'd definitely run an insert, especially if there's a cheerlift to the top. Mm -hmm. Mm. Just from a weight point of view? Yeah, I just the rotational mass once again. I'm so picky about weights. It's, it's a tough call. And do you run them front and rear, or do you notice that if you put one in the rear that it feels unbalanced between that and the front? No, I haven't noticed it, but I'm going to Nelson this weekend. I'm taking the Canevo. I've got an Enduro tire on the back, so I'm trying to decide whether to put an insert in the rear but I think I'm actually more likely to put one in the front because I've only got a trail tire on the front. So it's, it's, it's hard to try and work out. Do I put an enduro tire on the front and no, no insert? I don't want to do both. It's going to be, I'm going to be smacking into some rocks, but I'll try not to, but you can't help the back. So I'm thinking about putting a lightweight insert in the back just because it's steep and gnarly. The rocks and Nelson are so sharp. There's something about Nelson that just destroys tires, eh? It's quite mm. phenomenal. I don't think there's anywhere else in the country where you just wear out a set of minions in a, like a long weekend of riding. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, you come back and the, the sidewalls are all hatched from being yeah. just compressed. And oh, yeah. Like, you go to the gorge in Nelson, your tire's gone. Yeah. That rear tire's getting chucked out. That's, you know, two days of riding. Sure, you're doing a lot of riding. This is a problem now with e-bikes. Just a normal e-bike ride, I'm doing just as much as I would do at the gorge but I'm doing it in you know, three hours instead of six. Yeah, I mean, that's gonna have, you know, it has had you know, a significant like chain and brake pads and rotors, oh. just everything gets worn, right? Yeah. Like it's, yeah, and it's such an interesting one as an industry. I don't think we do a great job of like explaining that up front, but no. <laughs> this $10,000 toy is just gonna destroy brake pads and chains. <laughs> yeah. So what else? Do you have a break? Yeah. Okay.